for that um, introduction. Uh, so you all know my name. Uh, I work for Adobe, uh, and I'm deeply interested in language, culture, type, um, and these days, emoji. And that's, uh, these are the things that I want to talk to you about today. Um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about and, uh, is to basically counter some of these arguments that started popping up with the advent of emoji, that emoji is destroying language. Um, but uh, concerns about language always have to do with our identity and uh, the narrative that uh, emoji are destroying language uh, tries to put language in a privileged position uh, and, and show that the author uh, of the previous article that I showed um, sees himself as part of a higher echelon of society. Um, so narrative is, is always something that is very personal and as I give my, my narrative today, um, it will say a lot about me and my, my point of view of the world. Um, and in fact, the argument that uh, emoji are destroying language is a very old argument that goes back all the way to Socrates and Plato, uh, who told the story of the Egyptian god Thoth, who invented writing, um, was telling King Famous about how wonderful his invention was, that it would make people smarter and it would improve their memories. But uh, King Famous uh, counters uh, this uh, statement saying that um, writing would make people uh, have a lot of knowledge but not very much wisdom. And this is a very old anti-technology uh, argument where uh, we tend to be, uh, we tend to be wary of any new technology and we can either focus on their, their uh, good aspects or we can focus on what we view as uh, negative aspects. Um, so Famous actually said that uh, where Thoth said that um, writing would be a new magical cure, Famous saw it as a potential poison. Um, so language all has to do with uh, transcendence and cooperation. And that's why we developed language as a species. And that's one of our great strengths, is to be able to cooperate and, and transcend ourselves and to work together with others. And, and uh, language is this amazing tool that helps us to do that. Um, and it's all built up from a basis of signals uh, that mean thing, various things like stop, slow down, and go. And even before we evolved into modern humans, uh, we had what were called play signals that helped us to determine the difference from uh, aggressive play and real aggression. So these play signals would later become in humans laughter and smiling. So this speaks to the importance of gesture as part of our communication. And in fact, uh, modern studies show that up to 70% of our communication with others has to do with nonverbal content. So things like gesture and tone of voice and uh, touch. These are all important aspects of communication. And uh, other studies also have shown that when uh, our ability to, to move uh, is limited, that also increases levels of disfluency. And this is an example of some of the earliest representative art. Um, once uh, mankind was able to uh, preserve gesture in the form of art and representations of the natural world, uh, it allowed for them to transcend uh, space and time. Although we may not know exactly what the people who made these paintings uh, how they saw the world, we can have some, we can start to sense, uh, have a sense of how uh, they may have uh, seen it. 
Um, and this is the crux of the message that I want to uh, point out today, that uh, although we like to make divisions, uh, such as language and emoji, uh, between, um, between uh, script and, uh, and visual representation, these things are not that different. And um, in fact, uh, I'm gonna start with the, the development of uh, the alphabet and uh, starting with the Egyptians who saw the world in this kind of mythopoetic way, basically meaning that they made sense of the world by telling stories, which is not really any different from the way we make sense of the world today. Um, I already mentioned uh, Thoth and how the Egyptians saw him as uh, the creator of the alphabet, but uh, Thoth himself is a symbol, and he uh, symbolizes human intelligence and our ability to do such things as uh, measure, make measurements, um, to make marks, and uh, to, and writing. Um, and as you can see here, uh, we have Thoth uh, writing, but we also see a larger version of, of his character. Um, so that you can see that in this particular example, uh, at, at the beginning of writing, um, there's not really a, a big distinction between uh, the writing and the, the picture carvings. They're, they're identical, they're just on a different scale. Um, and one of the powerful things that language does is it allows for us, again, to tell stories and to uh, come up with fictions. And these fictions do have impact on our realities. Um, and uh, in fact, our, our language and our, our concept system is all based on metaphors. Um, so even our most abstract concepts have some basis in our physical reality. So, given the history of writing here, we have our friend the Ibis again. Um, and the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system works in su such a way that uh, you'll be given the, the drawing of something, and then uh, not only did they have the pictographic uh, representation, but they also had phonetics. So this uh, is a letter, a phonetic letter, um, and it, uh, is th it corresponds to the ibis that we saw in the previous slide. Um, the name of this letter is Ib, which is the name of the ibis in Egyptian. Um, and then the, uh, the early uh, Semitic um, tribes took the Egyptian writing system and they adapted it for their own languages. Uh, they repurposed the Eib here on the right for their letter Beit, uh, which meant that uh, they had to come up uh, with another letter to represent the glottal stop sound, which the letter Eib represented. So they used uh, Alp, uh, the head of the ox on the left, um, to represent uh, that glottal stop sound. Later, the Phoenicians took this writing system and they simplified it. Um, you can see the ox head on the right and the, the bent, the house, on the left. Um, and you can see that the shapes are becoming more abstract. This allowed, this is, uh, uh, did two, two things, excuse me, simultaneously. Um, it uh, provided iconic abstraction which uh, actually allowed for greater semantic expansion, meaning that uh, having a, a more abstract uh, presentation allowed for these letters to uh, encapsulate greater meaning. And this is a form of aniconism, um, which was a trend uh, among the earlier Semitic people. Um, that corresponds with things such as mono, the development of monotheism and uh, a greater identification away from the body and towards our thoughts. Um, and the Greeks 
uh, developed this to a high level in their idea of logos. And uh, you can see a corresponding visual uh, representation where they took uh, the Phoenician script and made it even more rationalized and simplified. So here we see the head of the ox, which becomes the letter alpha, and the, the beta, which is the bet. Um, so the names of the letters even correspond to uh, the previous uh, proto-synactic names of letters, but uh, you don't really see an ox and you don't really see a house there anymore. Um, next came the Romans, and this is from the Trajan inscription. And now we have letter forms that are identical to the uppercase letters that you'll find in modern fonts today. And uh, this whole process can be summarized by this quote, this famous quote by Eric Gill. Um, so when, as typographers and type designers, we typically think of the Trajan column as the, the letters. But uh, this is actually what the Trajan column looks like. Um, only a very small portion of this giant monument is letters. And in fact, most of the Trajan column looks like this. It's uh, more of a pic pictorial representation um, of a narrative. Uh, later, we adapted other symbols, such as uh, numbers and punctuation, um, taking them from other cultures to help us to provide, in the case of numbers, an uh, even greater level of abstraction to our language. And uh, we can look at punctuation as some of the various, very first forms of emoji, um, things that allowed for us to start to introduce uh, pauses and different tones of voice to, to writing. Um, and so if we keep abstracting uh, our writing, we take the letter A and we turn it into Unicode uh, binary uh, code, and this is the underlying code that your computer sees when it, um, you're sending a, a capital le letter A to someone. And if we abstract it even further, we can interpret the zeros as being off and dark and the ones as being on and light. And so the letter A can be represented this way, which speaks back to seeing things in, in terms of opposites and uh, binary um, ways of, of thinking. And the reason why binary thinking is so powerful is because uh, the way the human brain works is that it, we're constantly simulating uh, our own version of reality based on the inputs that the, the brain is getting from our senses. And in order to be efficient in doing this work, our, our brain develops the uh, ideas of opposites. So it thinks of things in terms of up versus down, white versus black, happy versus sad, uh, mind versus body, uh, white and male versus uh, black and female, uh, science versus religion. Um, and in economics, one of the first things that they teach you is about rationality, and I'm going to have a sip of water now. And rationality is this concept that we all have preferences and that we can rank those preferences. Um, and if we do a little bit of, of linguistic analysis, we see that uh, this is, these are kind of the predominant metaphors in the English language. And you can start to see some interesting patterns emerging where obviously in English we're very concerned with time and uh, we rank uh, things such as, we talk about things such as man and, and children much more than we do uh, about woman, women. And uh, when we start to uh, see these patterns and how we correlate things within our, our concept uh, in the West, we see that we tend to uh, give preference to what we see on the top. We, we like to identify more with our thoughts 
Uh, we, uh, th we prefer language to imagery. Uh, we often see uh, civilization as being preferable to nature. Um, and uh, we devalue things such as uh, emotion and magic and, uh, and um, our, our feelings. And this way of uh, kind of approaching the world and, and kind of favoring one aspect of ourselves over another aspect or, or, or seeing someone in a way where you uh, split their good attributes from their bad attributes is, is called splitting. Um, and it's usually an a ego response to uh, uncertainty. Um, and this goes back to kind of making those uh, split decisions. Um, but in this uh, great book by Yuval Noah Harris, he makes this statement that breakups are just uh, a roadblock on the way towards unity, um, which brings us to emoji. Um, and, uh, and part of the reason why I am passionate about emoji is because I believe that it uh, helps us to revalue our physical reality and our senses and not necessarily prioritize um, our concepts and our ideas and our intellect over these things. Um, emoji developed uh, in a similar path to what I just showed to uh, the Latin alphabet, um, but it comes to us from the East. Uh, so starting uh, with the Chinese Han writing system, you can see how they developed from picture writing on the top left to uh, a more stylized character of a horse. Uh, so this is a character Ma in Chinese for a horse. I probably used the wrong tone. Um, you can see uh, here that uh, how it kind of correlates to the shape of the actual horse. And then uh, we now have emoji representations of the same thing. But where did emoji come from? Emoji was created by Shigetaka Kurita, um, who developed this set of picture symbols uh, to act as characters. Because um, as we just saw in, uh, China, in Japanese, which uses the, the Chinese Han uh, symbols, um, it's very common to, to use a single character to, to express a whole idea. And that was the original intention of, of emoji. Um, but one of the great aspects of emoji is that it allows us to reintroduce into our uh, communication more empathy. Um, these are some of the top uh, metaphors that are used in emoji according to emoji tracker. And you can see that these correspond uh, with feelings of, of love and affection. And uh, only one, one uh, or two uh, what we commonly think of as negative emotions. Um, and so this speaks to the importance of actually what I want to say is that uh, some people, as in the title of, of, uh, of the article at the very beginning, um, some people want to pit emoji and, and language against each other. But in fact, when used together, uh, they help us to have uh, better communication. Um, and so this is just an ex example message that shows uh, how the emoji can be used to kind of be a sort of emotional glue that holds things together. I'm just going to skip a bit. Um, emoji also, seeing things visually can help us to see some underlying uh, biases that we may not have realized when emoji was first rolled out. Uh, people immediately noticed that Apple's depiction showed men as active and women as negative but now we have gender parity in emoji. Um, and uh, this speaks to the importance of our narratives and our stories and our metaphors. Uh, one of my favorite examples is how Disney uh, 
switched up their narrative for what it means to be a Disney apprentice, as someone who needs to be rescued, to someone who helps heal others uh, by uh, acknowledging and helping them through their trauma. Um, and uh, this non-binary view of the world uh, is what led me to uh, advocate for um, a more androgynous form of emoji. Uh, I see this as, uh, to me, androgyny is the transcendence of our own selves and being able to combine uh, our masculine and feminine aspects. And although I may look like and present as the emoji on the left, I generally feel inside uh, that I, I relate to the emoji more in the center. And when I'm at my best, this is my favorite emoji. So thank you very much.